Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crank Divers. Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode. Hello everyone, welcome back. Thanks for joining us once again. Yep, here we are for another Crime Divers episode. So Jill, where in the world are we? We're in the UK. And um, what's the title? The Bullseye Killer. Okay, shall we dive in? Yep, let's dive in. So we're in Little Haven. It's a peaceful rural place in Pembrokeshire, West Wales. And from looking at it online, it looks a beautiful place and it's a bit like, you know, nice walks and beaches. Scenery, and, nice mm-hmm. and scenic. It's a, a popular holiday destination, but in 1989, sorry, it became the scene of a horrific crime. Wow. So, we're in June 1989. Peter and Gwenda Dixon, they were a couple in their 50s, and they went on holiday there. And they stayed in a tent at the Hillston Camping and Caravan Park. They've, they've been going there for summer holiday, like, every year for the past 15 years. So, mm-hmm. they obviously they were well. familiar with the place, you know, they obviously loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, they were they were from Oxfordshire. Peter was fifty one and he was a marketing manager who liked running. And Gwenda was fifty two and she was a secretary for social services in Whitney, Oxfordshire. And she liked to play badminton. So they were they were quite an active couple. Mm-hmm. And um, and they both they both liked walking. Mm-hmm. So their campsite um, bordered on the scenic coastal path. And on the last day of their holiday, they decided to go for a walk. It was the 29th of June and it was a nice day. The sun, the sun was shining. Um, it must have been raining the night before because they actually bu- they, they bumped into somebody else and they said, oh, we're going to go for a walk to let the tent dry. Oh, right, so okay. it must have been mm-hmm. raining the night yeah. before. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, this would be the last time they walked the coastal path. Oh, no. So two days later, when, when his parents hadn't come home from their holiday, Peter and Gwenda's son, Tim, reported them missing and police started a search. Don Evan, former chief superintendent, said um, he, he was just standing like overlooking, overlooking the bay, just like, oh, what could, what could have happened to them? You know, like trying to figure yeah. out what, where they were. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, two dog handlers shouted for him to come quickly. Mm. He ran along the coastal path for about 300 yards. And he said there, down in the ravine on the right hand side was the most horrific scene he had ever come across. It was Peter and Gwenda's bodies. The bodies of Peter and Gwenda were lying six feet apart. Peter was tied up and they had been robbed and shot in the face at point blank range with a sawn off shotgun. Oh, good. So Pembrokeshire's largest ever murder inquiry was launched, sending shockwaves through the quiet rural com- community. You know, like this, this had always been thought as like a, a safe place to live. Mm-hmm. It was a place for holiday makers to relax and enjoy the, the coastal walks and scenery. It's just, you know, it's totally unheard shocking. of. It's, mm-hmm. um, so the, the killer had terrified Peter into giving him his PIN number and he had used it to withdraw £300 from cash machines in the area. Witnesses provided a, a description of the sus- of a suspect seen using the cash machine in Pembroke and a wanted poster with a sketch of him was made. And police appealed to the public asking if anyone had seen him in the West Wales area over the last f- three weeks. They interviewed three... Th- Sorry, they interviewed 6,000 people, but they were, they were no co- closer to catching the killer. Mm-hmm. One person questioned was a local farm labourer, John William Cooper. Peter Dixon's wedding ring was missing when his body was found, and it was discovered that John Cooper had actually recently sold a ring. Oh, right. When asked, he said it was his own wedding ring, mm-hmm. and his family backed him up. So there was nothing else to suggest that he was a suspect or a person of interest Mm -hmm. but what police didn't know was that cooper actually had a history of violence and he actually was the killer oh right okay but he didn't get caught until much later okay so uh, his son andrew he said that when he was nine he was nine when his his dad first got violent with him and that was because andrew refused to wear a particular pair of shorts obviously his dad was like right you know put them on and Mm -hmm. he was like no i don't want it in he said that his dad didn't treat him like a child. He said he would come at him, frothing at the mouth. His eyes would be bulging. He would clench his fists and he would just lay into him like he was made of rubber. He had previously bounced him off 
door frames and uh, like just threw him around like he was a doll. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to everybody else, he was a good guy. Nobody knew that this was what he was like, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone loved um, um, all his friends, you know, every, like down at the pub, he was, a, he was a regular local pub and he played darts. So he was well thought of in the community, well known in the community. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was on the local darts team mm -hmm. and he had loads of, you know, lots of friends, like everybody knew him mm -hmm. and he was a good guy, mm -hmm. according to them. To them. Um, so no one sus suspected Cooper of the murders and after 18 months, the inquiry was scaled down. So one double murder in this countryside community was shocking, but actually four years earlier, less than 10 miles away from Little Haven, there had actually been another double murder. Oh, right. So in ne December 1985, police were called to a house fire in Scoston Park and inside were the badly burned bodies of Richard Thomas and his sister, Helen. Richard had been shot in the stomach and the head and Helen had been tied up and shot in the head. Um, police believed this was a robbery gone wrong. They thought the robber had targeted... The... Did you say something there? No. Oh, sorry. No. I, could have sw I was just moving and I could have sworn that you were going to say something. I think I kind of moved my head, but I wasn't going to say anything. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so they thought the robber had targeted the house knowing that Helen was home alone, but had been disturbed when Richard came home right. and the robber panicked and killed them. Mm-hmm. Um, as there's a good chance that they, they could have known who he was. So the officers carried out standard house-to-house -house inquiries and guess who lived less than a mile away? John Cooper. Uh -huh. So the whole family gave each other an alibi saying they were all at home together on the night of the murders, so the police believed them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had no reason not to believe them at that time. No, I guess not. Um, so Cooper's son, Andrew, said that his dad had told them that the police would be coming round asking questions about the murder and he just told them casually to say, you know, we're all together. He said, you know what the police are like, they'll just annoy us otherwise. And his family actually didn't really think that anything of it. You know, they were just like, all right, okay. Like, you know. Yeah, they just obviously stuck together as a family and thought, <laughs> oh, well, yeah. yeah, you know. And, you know, if if... If one of us hasn't got an alibi, then they're just, the police are just going to harass us. So we're just going to say that we're all together. Uh -huh. um, and obviously, the, his family must never have suspected that. I mean, they must have known that it, obviously they knew he was violent, but they must have never expected to murder somebody. Yeah, otherwise you would think they surely yeah. wouldn't have they would given have, him an alibi. Yeah. So Andrew, but Andrew did say that, like, looking back, all the clues were there, but he just wasn't mature enough to, like, you know, to... Uh, to piece all the um, I think the hindsight's together. a great thing, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, I mean, of course. You know, you, uh, when you're in the moment and that, you might not see things, but then at a later date and you look back and you go, actually, do you know what? There was, like, some red flags there that I maybe... Yeah, and if realized. he was just a kid... Yeah. I mean, when you're just a kid, you kind of... If, you're, if your mum or your dad's like, oh, you know what, just just, just say this, just say we're all together, it, like, casually, as if it's not a big thing, you would probably would kind of go... Ah, fine, whatever, you know, I'll do that. Yeah, exactly. It's not a big... No, you believe everything your parents tell you, really. Yeah. So, John Cooper had evaded capture twice, and in 1996, he struck again. So, in March, because, you know, as I say, I mean, well, I kind of, you gathered that that was him that did mm. murder the, the brother and sister. Mm -hmm. I just realised I didn't actually say specifically that he did. Mm -hmm. um, in March, five local teenagers were walking through fields in Milford Haven... And it was just getting dark and they saw a man walking towards them with a torch. He was wearing a balaclava, dark clothing and was holding a shotgun. And he told them to get down on the ground. He raped a 16-year-old girl and sexually assaulted a 15-year-old girl. And he later demanded money from the rest of the group. He fired the shotgun in the air as a warning shot. So they must have been absolutely terrified. Oh my God, you would be, yeah, totally. But I just think it's, I thought it was strange that he would target them for money. Like, a group of teenagers. You wouldn't expect yeah. teenagers to have very much money. Exactly. And, I mean, going back to, obviously, you know, the murders at the start, I mean, if it was £300 they took out the cash machine, it's not even, what, is that what their life was worth, just getting 300 quid out of the cash machine? Yeah, I know. So, no, no one was caught. So, the Pembrokeshire Police now had three un unsolved violent crimes in 10 years. And also, during this time, the area was plagued with burglaries and armed robberies. There was a pattern to these robberies. It was always houses with a single female in... During the evening, by a guy with a with a with a son of shotgun who wore a balaclava. 
In November 1996, the intruder was disturbed during one such robbery and as he ran away from the scene, he discarded items in a hedge. And as the, as the police were doing house-to-house -house inquiries, they found stolen goods in one of them and that house belonged to John Cooper. <laughs> so police believed that he had carried out 70, about 70 burglaries. Oh dear. So along with, his, uh, with, along with his house, his family's extended family's houses were also searched as well and a lot of stolen items were found in their houses as well. As well, so mm -hmm. I don't know if they were involved or if they were just that's where he was keeping. Yeah, stuff. yeah, and they probably didn't realise. Yeah, know. I don't. Well, I don't know. They might have. They might not have. I don't know. So the evidence that they found connected Cooper to twenty nine burglaries and one armed robbery, where he used a sawn off shotgun and wore a balaclava, and that was when John Cooper first came on the radar for being a suspect of the murders of Peter and Gwenda and Richard and Helen. Mm -hmm. So. I saw footage of him being taken from a police van in handcuffs. Like, so he, he got he got out of the of the police uh, van mm -hmm. and there was, like, there was cameras, like, obviously the press and whatnot, and there was kind of people just standing around and he's mm -hmm. shouting, I'm not a murderer! I'm not a murderer! And I'm like, wait a bit, like, to draw attention to yourself, eh? I know. I mean, clearly, <laughs> he's obviously been lying there because he is a murderer. <laughs> well, yeah. But, oh, he was that, you know, the way he was sh shouting and it was just like, shut up. <laughs> Stop being a knob. Yeah, you're really in no position <laughs> to be saying those things. So, as Cooper was denying the murders, the police felt that to connect them to the double murders, there would, there would be, there would need to be what they called the golden nugget of forensic science. And at that time, for forensic analysis drew a blank. And in the same footage, he was shouting at the cameras, "They're using me to clear old crimes that shouldn't be allowed." <laughs> and I'm like. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> so Cooper was sentenced to 14 years for burglary and robbery. Oh, wow, so he got right. done for that. Okay. So for eight years, all the evidence collected for the case, the murder case, um, or cases, should I say, was put into storage. And in 2006, it was finally time to launch a cold case review of, of the three crimes. Mm -hmm. So now they were hoping that forensic science was advanced enough to lead them to the golden nugget of evidence they needed, which was a daunting task. Mm -hmm. There was about a million and a half to two million pieces of paper, oh, wow. which police had to physically go through, and there were something like 5,000 exhibits. So the team had to make vital decisions about what might give them that crucial forensic link, because they knew that they couldn't go through 5,000 exhibits as it just wasn't practical and they just didn't have the money for it you know they yeah. didn't have that budget so they had to whittle it down to what was yeah they had to sort of make decisions on what they thought would lead them you know yeah you know what i mean yes <laughs> yeah they had to see what evidence was more crucial than other parts yeah. of evidence that might help them and well get their, getting their golden nugget mm. as you've said you worded that better than i did <laughs> <laughs> i'm just waving my hands about here expecting you to understand me <laughs> And our listeners are probably going, we can't see you. No. <laughs> so over the next few months, they selected items to send to the forensic lab. And scientists scored, scoured them. Scoured, scoured them, is that a word? Scoured, yeah. Because uh, I'm looking at it going, that looks like scored, but that's not the right word. Scoured. It? scoured. For potential DNA evidence. In the meantime, a team was put together to find out as much about John Cooper as possible. So in a social environment, he could come across as a very pleasant man, as I said earlier. The people who he played darts with all said he was very well-mannered mm -hmm. and well-respected. But when they talked to his son, Andrew, they heard a very different story. As I said before, Cooper was violent towards Andrew. And he said, Andrew said the worst time was one day that he had been fishing down at the pond. And as he was on his way back, his dad was going out shooting and they bumped into each other. Cooper just walked up to Andrew and hit him in the face. So he fell to the ground and he put his foot on his chest. Oh, lovely. He then put the gun in Andrew's mouth. I mean, this is his son. I know, I was just... Um, and he told... Crazy. Like, so he put, the, he put the gun in Andrew's mouth and he told him how worthless he was and that the family didn't want him anymore and he was going to end his life. Oh, my God, that's awful. So Andrew, like, absolutely terrified, was just watching his dad's finger on the trigger. Mm -hmm. And he, like, like, his dad knew that he was watching it and he was, like, slowly just, like, pulling his, his finger mm. on the, squeezing the trigger. Mm -hmm. And then when his finger got halfway down, Andrew just closed his eyes and accepted, right, this is it, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And then he felt the click and his dad had pulled the trigger. But there was no cartridge in the gun. But of course, Andrew didn't know that. No, he didn't know. That's horrible. And that he said that was the day that his childhood had ended. It was just, like, that was it. Was well, just... Can you imagine that? 
Yeah, he was 11. That's how old 11. he was. He was oh 11 when his dad did that to him. That's unbelievable. One day when Andrew was 12, Cooper grabbed him on the landing in the house and threw him into his bedroom. He bounced him off the walls and onto the bed and he started punching him and strangling him. And then he, he then punched him in the back while he was holding his neck. And Andrew now, as an adult, mm -hmm. Andrew now has 12 screws holding his spine together oh, because wow. of that. And his dad never even got done? No. In, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know what they would have told. Because, uh, you know, like, obviously we'd have went to the hospital. That's what and, saying, obviously needed medical attention. Yeah, so, so you would have thought that maybe social services would have been involved. Yeah. But then if he's not going to say it was his dad, I don't know what mm. they would have said had happened to him. But, yeah, that's true. But, yeah, like, imagine that. Because he might just say they had an accident or something. Yeah, like. oh, that's one. I mean, he could have... I don't know what he would have said, like... I'm no medical expert, but he could have just said, like, fell down the stairs or, you know, mm, something yeah. that could have been consistent with, that, with those injuries. Mum wasn't aware of the situation, and I guess she would just accept that as the story. Yeah. And... See, I don't know. I didn't see if there was... What... If the other family members, what they knew or what they didn't mm, know. Yeah. Mm. So, John Cooper was a gambler. And when looking into his background... He told police that he'd won £90,000 on Spot the Ball in 1979. So Spot the Ball is a traditional newspaper promotion where the player has to guess the position of a ball, mm -hmm. which has been removed from a photo of a ball sport, especially football. In the UK, the last big payout was 2004. Wow. So we need to start playing it. Spot the Ball. <laughs> yeah, because there must be a massive... If, if, if it builds up, the jackpot builds up... Uh, yeah. If that's the way they do it. Is it still in newspapers to this day then? I think so. Hmm. We'll check that out and start playing it. Well, does it say which one? <laughs> <laughs> How do we'll, they find out? We'll Google. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, so yeah, he said that he'd won, so he won £90,000. So, that I mean, that prize money should have set his family up for life because, you know, that was a lot of money. Well, it's well, still, still a, lot, a lot of money, but, yeah. but probably even more so back in yeah. a few years ago. <laughs> but over the following years, he lost it all. Along with gambling and drinking it away, he entered into a number of business ventures which were just doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. As he lost money, he obviously lost the lifestyle that he had become accustomed to when he, you know, when he won that money. So that gave police a better understanding as to why he started robbing people. Ah, because yes. he was like, he wanted to keep that lifestyle. I get you, that. So that's a motive. Yeah, obviously he wanted money, but it was also about risk taking and excitement, which is what he would have got from the gambling as well. Yeah. So, Dr. Adrian West, who is a forensic criminal psychologist, said, quote, One of the things I think is particularly sad, saddening about the murder of the Dixons is they were a couple happily walking along a coastal path on a bright summer's day, and I think perhaps this man had a very strong sense of envy that people could live a life like that, apparently hap happily when he, he so blatant, blatantly could not, end quote. So, you know, it was just like... There could be some jealousy in there. Yeah, yeah like, they, like he's just seen look them Look at them along. all nice and happy, enjoying their walk and mm. on their summer holidays. Mm. I'm assuming, well, I'm serious because we don't know, but did he not have that with his wife? I, I don't know anything about his family. I only yeah. know about his son. So. I mean, it mustn't have if he was feeling a bit jealous, but... Um, so, it, like, John Cooper craved respect. So when the interview team interrogated him about the murders, they were told to listen to him and let him feel that he was in control because, you know, mm. that's what he wanted. He would, he th he felt that he deserved respect. All right, okay. And they had to respect him to, for him to talk, basically. Okay, fair enough. I suppose if that's what you need to do to get him to talk, <laughs> well, then that's, yeah. that's what oh, they need. That would be so hard to do that, though, wouldn't it? I know. But if you need to get an end result out of it, then I suppose it's worth, worth just letting him feel like he's the big man. <laughs> yeah. So in July 2008, while waiting for a forensic breakthrough, the team spent four days interviewing Cooper. He was still serving time for burglary, but he was going to be released soon. Mm -hmm. So for the first three days, they just let him talk, hoping that if he felt relaxed, he would maybe like give something away. He talked about things like how he never really wore his wedding ring because of the work that he did. Um, so, you know, that was him saying that that's, that's why, why he sold it. Well, I'm sorry, no. You don't just sell your wedding ring. No, I mean, I, I understand people don't wear their wedding ring, like, for various reasons. <laughs> yeah, I haven't got mine on, I don't but wear yeah, mine. But I certainly would never... I wouldn't it. sell it. Mine no. is sitting in my... Well, it's not in my jewellery box. It's in a little jar. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't wear my wedding ring just... I, well, I put it on when I go out. 
<laughs> so just to show everybody that you're married. <laughs> but like, no, for, I'm like, I don't know. On a day to day basis, I don't wear it okay. just because I, never take I don't off. really wear jewelry. Mm-hmm. Um, and like my husband John, he hasn't wore his. For, he's actually got his his ring finger tattooed now, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, his but he's still got his wedding ring. That, that is actually in the jewelry box. Mm-hmm. No, it isn't because I was wearing it on my thumb. No, that's in the same place. As mine. Why were you wearing his? Because I was wearing it on my thumb. Because it was it was nice, a thumb ring. Oh, okay. Why not? Because it's his wedding ring, not yours. But he doesn't wear it. I was just wearing. I wasn't wearing it as a wedding ring. I was wearing it as a thumb ring. Right. But anyway, mine's is on my finger. Anyway, I still wouldn't sell it. Yes, that's so the point. That is the point. Yeah. I mean, I get that some people some people sell it if they need money and things like that. But I know, but it's. Well, to me, it's sentimental. Well, yeah, it? of course, but the, if you're that dead, if, if it was a choice between your child eating and your child not eating, you would. Well, yes, you would probably sell it, wouldn't you? This is probably true, but that's not the case for him. No, because it wasn't his wedding ring; it was somebody else's side. As we know, <laughs> yeah. Um, right, where was I? Yeah, and they they were they they were asking about they were asking him about his handling of a shotgun, and he kept referring to a particular shotgun that he had used during. During a robbery that he'd been convicted of, so he wasn't bothered about talking about that because he'd already been yeah. convicted of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he believed that the judge in his robbery trial had ordered the gun to be destroyed, and he seemed worried that it hadn't been destroyed, that it had been kept. Right. Um, but he, like as, as I said, he was just about finished serving the sentence for that. So the police were like, well, why is he bothered about that gun, about whether it's destroyed? Because mm-hmm. obviously he's been convicted of the crime he used it in. Yeah, so exactly. So why, why yeah. would it matter? Uh-huh. So that they made them think that maybe he could have used that as a murder weapon as well, mm-hmm. as for the robbery. So luckily they hadn't destroyed the gun. Um, and they asked for that gun to be examined again. And like Cooper was just sent, sent back to his cell to serve the last few months of his prison term. And officers could see that, like, Cooper was confident that he had convinced them that he was innocent. He was like, yeah. Yeah, nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. I'm good. Uh Yeah. And and he was like, I'm not going to get charged, you know. And he was partly right. Police didn't believe that he was innocent, but he wasn't charged. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was released from prison in January 2009. Uh, Dr. Adrian West had a conversation with one of the officers, and it caused the officer concern, concern. He had said that the person who had committed the murders, meaning Cooper, mm-hmm. um, had enjoyed what they had done. Right. And that he would be released into the community having ideas about what he's going to do. He, he'll fail and he'll enter a spiral of offending and he will kill again. Because that was a psychiatrist saying that. Mm-hmm. So after serving 10 years for burglary and armed robbery, Cooper was released and police, and the police still believed that he had committed four shotgun murders, a rape and a sexual assault, but they still hadn't been able to find the proof. So, I mean, they're letting this dangerous man, but there's nothing but again, nothing they could do got, about it. If you've not got the proof, then you can't, you can't charge somebody, can you? So they were still examining the evidence, they ha- um, but hadn't been able to find any DNA evidence. So they changed tack and started to look at clothing fibres. Analysts uh, looking at tapings from various ex- exhibits under a microscope... Um, sorry, analysts were looking at tapings from various exit ex- <laughs> Oh... I'm hot. <laughs> Analysts were looking at tapings from various exhibits under a microscope to microscope to identify any matching fibers. Why was that so hard? Got their name going. <laughs> One of the items that police chose for examination it was a pair of Cooper's shorts. They picked those shorts because when a witness described the man they had seen using the cash card belonging to Peter Dixon, mm-hmm. the shorts, the man that man that they described um, that he was wearing were identical to a pair of Cooper's. So, for three years, they had been meticulous in looking at exhibits. Every day, they would say, right, this is the day we're going to get the results. Mm-hmm. And we're, you know, that we're looking for it. And finally, in April 2009, there was a breakthrough. Mm-hmm. So, forensic experts had been examining tapings from the shorts, looking for fibre matches, but they actually discovered a spot of blood. Ooh. But you're not going to believe who the blood belonged to. Oh, okay. <laughs> this 20-year-old spot of blood, because that's how long it's been, uh-huh. on Cooper's short... Um, oh, no, that's not what I was thinking of. Oh, sorry. Well, there'll be another bit that you wouldn't believe. Oh, well, all right, then. I was getting all like, well, what's happening here? And now you've just totally got me no, deflated. No, I was also thinking of another bit. I, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote this episode a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, so we, new. <laughs> your memory's, memory's not great. Yeah, so the the 20-year-old... Spot of blood in Cooper shorts was Peter Dixon's, so no, no surprise there. Yeah. 
So they've got their golden nugget that they've been waiting for for so long. So they had a link to a double murder and the police were confident that this was just the start of many more. And sure enough, more evidence was found on the shotgun that uh, Cooper had used for the robbery, mm -hmm. and uh, the one that he hoped to be destroyed. It had been linked to Cooper in the first place by a screw from his shed in the garden. Oh. So basically, this gun had a hole in it where a screw came out, mm -hmm. and police, when they searched his shed, they found that screw in a pot in the shed. That's how meticulously they were like wow. looking. Because yeah. it was just like a... a like a little pot full of screws uh -huh. and they actually found Fine. a screw that went in that gun. Yeah. So this time they examined it again, but it was obviously a, a potential murder weapon this time because they'd, before it was just used in, an, robbery. An, in the armed robbery. Mm -hmm. And they saw that the barrels had been painted black, so they scraped away the paint mm -hmm. and they found blood underneath. And again, that blood turned out to be Peter Dixon's. Mm. So they knew they'd found the murder weapon and by Cooper... Painting the gun, he had actually preserved the evidence for them. Just gonna say, yeah, <laughs> duh, duh. <laughs> I don't know why he would paint the gun, unless he was trying to disguise it or something. Well, as, maybe for the robberies, maybe yeah. or that, in case somebody had identified, like, seen him with a particular shotgun and he painted it so it wasn't that I didn't realise that that was a thing that people would do, paint a gun. But then no. I don't know anything about guns. No, I don't so. know anything about guns either, so I can't help you. Yeah, so now they had evidence to prove that Cooper was the murderer of Peter and Glenda Dixon. And to strengthen their case, police wanted to connect Cooper to the description of the man seen using Peter's cash card. And he was identified because of being on the game show Bullseye. <gasps> that the dark game? Yeah. Do you see now you get my title, The Bullseye Killer? I used to love that. I used to watch that loads. And I used to love the, the trophy thing that they got. I, I always, Benji Bailey. I always used to want one. Well, footage of his appearance on the show was used by the prosecution to match him to witness reports. So that's how oh, wow. they identified him by looking at footage of mm -hmm. Bullseye. So for anyone who hasn't seen or heard of Bullseye, uh -huh. it was a British darts-themed TV game show that ran from 1981 mm -hmm. to 1990. There was... Was it really only until 1990? Yeah, but they, they did like... Oh, it must have been like the pizza and stuff of it. Yeah, obviously. But then they, they did sort of bring it back in like the 2000s, but... I never, mm, I actually, know. yeah, I vaguely remember. I don't think I watched it. I watched that it. wasn't the original. No. Um, so there'd be like three pairs, from what I can remember, mm -hmm. there was like three pairs of contestants and each pair consisted of an amateur darts player and a quizzer. Mm -hmm. So he would somebody be would the darts. Somebody would quiz and somebody would be the darts. Yeah, so he, he would be the darts player. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, th there were like different rounds with the quizzer answering, answering questions and the darts player throwing darts to choose what category they would answer the question on because I can remember yeah the, like they would, board, the, yeah the quizzer would say oh can I have sports please and they'd have to try and get in the sports category and answer yeah, the yeah. question yeah I vaguely remember that um, yeah. I, like, I, I, I can't remember it very well to be honest because you know my memory mm -hmm. uh, but it was a long time ago well it was to be fair yeah we'll I mean it only ran to 1990 we'll give you that one <laughs> um, but the contestants would play against each other and the winning pair had a chance at winning a big prize like a car or a caravan but I'm sure they won yeah. some random prizes like jet skis and yeah. things like that and then know. they got the trophy <laughs> I like the trophy <laughs> yeah that bendy bully uh -huh. so I think everybody got one of them whether you won or, won or lose okay. won or lost I think you got a bendy bully oh okay I think I I'm could be sure. wrong but um, yeah the, the, the bendy bully is the, the mascot of the show isn't it he's a, he's a bull yeah <laughs> exactly um, so Cooper appeared on the show just three weeks before he murdered Peter and Wendy Dixon. Oh, wow. So that he had already murdered Richard and Helen Thomas. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, nobody knew that. But like, so he was already a murderer when he was on the TV. Mm. But he obviously felt like he was untouchable to risk appearing on national television. Totally. Um, so Cooper and his partner got through the final round on Bill's Eye and they were given the option to take what they already had won or to gamble. So, of course, as Cooper was a gambler, they did, and they lost. Uh -huh. So I'm assuming that they went home with nothing but a bendy bully. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Um, so yeah, new luck. He never, he never yeah, won. Well, don't deserve to win it, to be fair. So uh, in May 2009, police arrested Cooper for murder, and there's actually footage of him being arrested. He walked round the corner, and the police walked up to uh, walked up to him, and they went to grab him. And he, like, he put up a fight. Like, he was like, no, no, you're not taking me. Mm -hmm. it, it took about five officers, like, to get him and get him in the car. Mm -hmm. um, 
So he'd only been released in the January and he was arrested again in the May, so oh. he wasn't free for very long. Good. Didn't deserve it. So police looked in his car and they found a rope, gloves and a map of Pembrokeshire. So they suspected it was only going to be a matter of time before he would have started to commit burglaries and thank maybe God. go on to murder again. Thank God they got him. Or thank God they were already on to him before that so that they could actually catch him again before he did actually exactly. hurt anybody else. So police took him to the station and the purpose was to connect... Cooper to the exhibit that had been forensically linked to the murders. During the interview, they showed him the artist's impression of the suspect who had used Peter Dixon's cash card and they showed him his shorts. Mm -hmm. And he admitted they were his shorts because he thought that they were trying to match his shorts to the artist's impression. Right. So he was like, yeah, they are my shorts, but that they don't match because his had been shortened and the ones in the picture hadn't been. Right. So basically... They aren't the same shorts because cause his were long-legged shorts mm -hmm. and the one in the picture were short-legged shorts. That's what he was saying. Yeah. saying. So the police asked forensics to, to um, forensic scientists to examine the shorts again and they had been shortened, possibly by Cooper's wife. So they unstitched the hem and inside the hem they found a DNA profile which matched... Peter Dixon? Nope. This is the one I thought it was before. You're never going to guess who. Mm, don't know. Julie Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to say who's Julie Dixon. Yeah, so I'm thinking who's Julie. I've not I've had that moment where I was like, am I supposed to know who she is and I'm going to make an idiot of myself here? <laughs> was that her name and I've forgotten it? No, her name was Gwenda. That's, that's, what, that's what I thought. I thought, have I got this wrong? Yeah, so who's, who's Julie Dixon? Gwenda and Peter's daughter. We haven't mentioned her. <laughs> no. We've only mentioned the son. No. Her son, her son who reported them. Yeah. They had oh. a daughter as well. Oh. And the DNA profile matched her, uh, the, uh, the daughter, Julie Dixon. So they, those shorts must have been taken from Peter's rucksack because there would have been no other reason as to why Julie's DNA oh, was on them. So they weren't... Because I was thinking... Well, so he had stole them. Right. So they were Peter's shorts. They was, weren't his. I was thinking, how is he having any contact with her? But right, okay. There you go. So he's stolen... So that's like, I would say that was the golden nugget ah, for you. Because he stole his shorts. And he yeah. stole the shorts, yeah. So he stole and he kept them for 10 years. Must have really liked the shorts. Must have. Um, soon, scientists began to uncover fibre matches. When Cooper was arrested in 1998 for burglary, uh, police had took sweepings from his shed. Fibres were found in those sweepings from gloves and a balaclava left in a hedge near Cooper's house. Scientists looked for matching fibres on exhibits from the four murders and the violent sexual attack on the teenagers. And fibres were found from, from the gloves were found in the clothing and underwear of the rape victim. Oh. So five, uh, fibres found in the pockets of the shorts were li linked to fibres on the socks of Richard Thomas. So that's oh. the other murders. Mm -hmm. So Cooper, Cooper's habit of storing and reusing his offending toolkit meant that fibres from each crime could be traced back to him. Mm -hmm. So faced with the forensic evidence, Cooper, um, though he still refused to admit his guilt, and he even tried to blame his own son. Ugh. So it's not bad enough that he's been beating his son up. He tried to blame he's him. He's trying to blame him for murder mm -hmm. and not whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, he said that his wife bought the shorts so he didn't know where they came from and that his son would take his clothes and wear them whenever he wanted. Oh. Ridiculous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So Cooper was held in custody until his trial, which was in March 2011. And again... He was shouting at the cameras as he went in, mm -hmm. saying, judge me after the trial, not before. Okay. Like, why are you drawing attention to yourself? Like, you could just know. be quiet and just... Oh, especially when you are actually guilty. I mean, maybe if you were innocent, <laughs> I could maybe understand it a bit more, but... You're just making an arse of yourself. Yeah, because you're totally guilty here. So. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, like, judge me after the trial, not before. Like, he, he must have thought that he was going to get off with it must for have. him to say that. Must be quite deluded. mm he just made an arse there, mm. so. Um, so he was charged with the murders of Helen and Richard Thomas in their home, Peter and Gwenda Dixon on the Pembrokeshire coastal path and the attack on five teenagers, including rape and sexual assault. The trial lasted nine weeks and the jury took three days to come to a verdict. They found him guilty on all charges. The judge said the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory sentence of life will mean just that. In September 2011, John Cooper lodged an application against his convictions and it was rejected in November 2012. 
Uh, after his conviction, police revealed that they thought Cooper could be involved in other murders. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Flo Evans was a 72-year-old widow who died soon after Peter and Gwenda Dixon. She lived near Cooper and was only two miles away from where Helen and Richard Thomas had lived. Flo was found fully clothed in a half-full cold bath in her cottage. Cooper and his wife both knew Flo and would visit, visit her regularly and he would like do odd jobs for her now and again. So Flo's family have always suspected her death was suspicious and she never took baths mm -hmm. and she wouldn't have had any hot water at the time of her death as the fire hadn't been lit in the kitchen. So she's not exactly going to run a cold bath, is she? Well, I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> so her death was recorded as accidental mm -hmm. with it said at the time that she must have slipped and fell into the bath and like hit her head and drowned. Oh, all right. But Flo, she, Flo didn't lock her door, yet it was found to be locked when her body was discovered. She had mentioned to her friends a few days before that she couldn't find her keys. Mm -hmm. Some items were missing from her house, including money and shotguns. It's thought that Cooper would have known where Flo kept money, so he's went there to rob her, to, you know, and she's disturbed him, so he's, so he's killed her. That's what's thought. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, so officers... Officers have said it really should have been a murder inquiry. Definitely. I don't know why it wasn't. I know. Um, it's also revealed that detectives were investigating any connection between Cooper and the uh, um, the unsolved murders of a couple who were shot at close range at their farmhouse in 1993. Harry and Megan Toos had been shot in the head, their bodies dumped in a cow shed and then covered with a carpet. The weapon was a shotgun, just like what Cooper used. And it was observed that there were are very there's very few double shotgun murders nationally, mm -hmm. and Cooper was known to have committed two double shotgun murders. So, this case was re-examined by the police, but to this day the case remains one of Wales' most notorious unsolved murders. Wow. And lastly, Griff and Patty Thomas were an elderly brother and sister who were found dead in December nineteen seventy six at their farmhouse. Their deaths were originally classified as a double murder. Until it was decided that they must have had an argument and Griff hit Patty over the head with a blunt instrument and then set himself on fire. But no weapon was ever found. Mm -hmm. A cash box had been emptied, a desk broken into and the back door was unlocked. Mm. So it was highlighted that it was highly unlikely that a serial killer would start killing at the age of 40, which is how old Cooper was when he first, when he committed his first known murders. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that he started killing earlier. Because, yeah, I'm sorry, but there was no weapon found. Mm -hmm. Cash box had been emptied. A desk broken into it. Back door was unlocked. And the man set himself on fire. Yeah, I, I mean, doubt that very... Who's going to set themselves on fire? I mean, you've got to be like a real crazy person to want to do that to yourself. If you're going to kill yourself after killing your sister, I doubt very much that you're going to set yourself on fire. I mean, there's other ways. Surely there's a better way. Although I do but, know a case of somebody that set themselves on fire locally to, to where I live. Really? Yeah, I think um, there was a guy who'd been going through like maybe like a breakup or something, hard time, and then he obviously had like kids involved and he must have had maybe mental health issues or something, but yeah, no, he basically set himself on fire. And, okay, I'll take that yeah. back then, maybe, maybe he would. But, but yeah, then that, that, was one of, that was like fairly recent, I'm sure that was only the last couple of years that that happened. Never so, heard about it. Yeah. But, oh well, I mean, well. So know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's just, possible. I'm just saying, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is possible, but I would say that's the probably a small minority of people that would probably do. Yeah, that, you know I mean, mean, I'm thinking it could well. I'm not going to blame anybody because you know he hasn't been charged or in the rub. I, I would. It sounds like murder to me. It definitely does. But yeah. So there you go. That was the bullseye killer. Excellent. Thanks. So for thank you to everybody for listening. If you would like to follow us, we should really say what our handles and stuff are because we, we're usually so lazy and we say oh our information's in the show notes but a lot of people don't, don't read the show notes they don't read the show or they, or they say they don't know where they are mm -hmm. um or they can't find them so okay let me think so our instagram and twitter we are at uh, crime underscore diaries underscore pod mm -hmm. we have youtube which, which is, is just crime divers crime divers is one word and then podcast crime divers podcast our email is crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. We're on TikTok, which is just all one word, crime divers podcast. You can, um, if you'd like to support the show financially, you can go to buymeacoffee.com and you can just make a one-off, you know, donation. Mm -hmm. um, 
well, you, you'll just find us Crime Divers Podcast. And if you would like to subscribe to our Patreon, we have three tiers. The um, lowest one starting is just a pound a month, which you'll get ad free episodes and then. And early access to our episodes. Early access. We we um we always publish them a couple of days earlier than what they are on the normal feed. Mm. And if you'd like some bonus content, we do extra episodes and things like that. Come over and have a look at patreon.com slash crime divers. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye.